When people think of an Axis victory in World War II, they imagine something like this. Germany, the dominant power in Europe, with the continent in their orbit, Russia their breadbasket, and Middle Africa established as a colony. Italy, controlling the Mediterranean in East Africa and dominating the Middle East. And Japan, annexing most of the South Pacific, breaking up China and India into small states easy to control, with their navy unchallenged in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. With their new allies, South Africa and Argentina, they dominate all continents, forcing the American nations into subservience and enforcing racist policies that lead to the death of entire peoples. This, however, is a complete fantasy. There is no way whatsoever the Axis could have possibly achieved this level of success, even if they were operating at their greatest capacity. For the Axis to be this successful, they would have had to be right about every racist claim they made. The Jews would have to be subversive elements in Germany, the Americans would have to be lazy hedonists, and the Russians and Chinese would have to be racially inferior to the Germans and Japanese. None of that is true. But the Axis, if led competently, could have made major gains across the globe, and shaped the world into a horrifying parody of what it is today. Over the course of this video, we'll be looking at how, on a strategic level, the Axis could have won the Second World War, and brought about a world dominated by totalitarian and militaristic regimes. To start, I just want to lay out a few ground rules for this video. I'm leaving most of the leadership intact for the Axis. The Germans could have been much more successful under a non-Nazi regime, but we won't be discussing that alternative in this video. Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo will all still be the leaders of their respective nations. I will be changing their minds about certain things, but not going against their personalities. Hitler, for instance, still invades Russia because he was always set on doing that, but how he goes about that will be changed so that the invasion results in German success. Finally, I'm not going to go over what an Axis-dominated world will look like from a social and political perspective that will be discussed in a separate video. This video will look at the military and political situation during the war and what needs to be done to bring the Axis powers to victory. I also won't be detailing how the Holocaust would work in this timeline, that will be covered in a different video. We're going to open this timeline in 1940 during the invasion of France. There's no reason to really change the Japanese invasion of China or the German invasions of Poland and Scandinavia. Some people debate if it was worthwhile for the Germans to invade Norway and leave at any given time 300,000 troops there, but the fact of the matter is they needed it to secure their iron supplies from Sweden. And if they didn't invade, the British would have, and the Germans would be there anyways. This would give the Germans the benefit of having Norway as a potential ally, but ultimately Hitler wanted to annex the country anyways, so that doesn't help with the long-term goals. As such, the operation goes as it did in our timeline. The first crucial difference in this timeline is Dunkirk. Allowing 300,000 Allied soldiers to escape from the port let the British regroup and was a huge morale boost for the Allies. This just didn't need to happen. If Hitler allowed the armored divisions to move forward, they would have been able to kill and capture this entire force. This would be a huge blow to British morale and deprive them of what was left of the British Expeditionary Force. The other major change to the invasion of France would be Italian involvement. In 1938 and 39, while Hitler tried to start a war over Czechoslovakia and Poland, the Italians intervened to try and start peace conferences so they could avoid being dragged into a war they weren't ready for. By this time, Hitler was sick of the Italians attempting to interfere. If the Germans had been upfront about the invasion and encouraged Italian participation, Mussolini could have dealt a more serious blow, but this is doubtful. Hitler had no reason to view the Italians any differently between September 1939 and May 1940. The Italians in our timeline didn't even enter the war against the Allies until France was clearly losing and Paris had been captured. Italian troops didn't cross the border until they knew an armistice was being signed by the French. Mussolini knew he would eventually face a war against Britain and France to achieve his territorial ambitions, but he had serious reservations. It seems unlikely he would join the war until after the Germans took out the bulk of the Allied armies at Dunkirk, but that's still a month before they joined in our timeline. Assuming they do this, with their forces in East Africa, they could seize French Somalia and probably land in Corsica, while pushing beyond the Alps into France. This might even hasten the French surrender by a few weeks. In our timeline, Italy was not present for the French surrender to the Germans, and they didn't get a seat at the negotiating table. In this timeline, with more extensive involvement, Hitler allows Mussolini to attend. While this is a bit far-fetched, Hitler looked up to Mussolini, going out of his way to save him from the Allies in 1943 in our timeline. So if the Italians actively participated in the Battle of France, I can see Mussolini getting back in Hitler's good graces. The peace would look much the same, except with Savoy and Nice being given to Italy, along with French Somalia being subsumed into Italian East Africa. The Italians would also push the French to hand over Tunisia and Corsica, but I doubt that would actually happen. The second major turning point is the Battle of Britain. 
I'm not about to make the case that the Germans could have or would have landed on the British Isles. Actually, the exact opposite. Hitler had little desire to invade Britain and hoped that by threatening to attack their homeland, they'd sue for peace. This attempt resulted in failure, while another, just as obvious and more efficient path was virtually ignored. Britain's strength at this time lay not in the British Isles, but in their massive empire. In this alternate timeline, the Germans worked with the Italians to dismantle the British positions in the Mediterranean. The British holdings around the Mediterranean were poorly equipped in 1940-1941, so a strong push by the Germans and Italians could have knocked them out of the region for good and dealt a serious blow to the empire as a whole. This could be achieved by the Germans landing in Malta in late 1940, using aircraft to bomb the island and drop paratroopers rather than attacking the British Isles. Meanwhile, the Italians would push out from East Africa with their spear manpower and take British Somalia and Sudan. While in North Africa, supported by a few German divisions, the Italians could push across Egypt and seize the Suez Canal. If you think this is ridiculous, I don't think you understand the British or Italian strength at this time. In June 1940, the Italians had around 300,000 soldiers in East Africa, compared to the 18,000 British soldiers in Sudan and Kenya. In November, the British had bolstered this to about 98,000, compared to the 371,000 Italian troops. While Kenya would be difficult to conquer due to their terrain, Sudan is mostly desert with only a flat river valley around the Nile to conquer. Hitler in our timeline only reluctantly sent a single Panzer regiment in March 1941 to ensure the Italians didn't lose all of North Africa. This force then went on to almost conquer Egypt by 1942. Imagine if the Germans had sent an actual army to North Africa only a few months after the Battle of France. If they were this invested in taking North Africa, it's doubtful Rommel would have even gotten the command there, with someone like Guderian a more likely candidate. Now there is the question of Gibraltar, which Spain was not willing to help the Axis conquer, but I find the holding of the rock to be inconsequential in the long run. In this timeline, the Axis steamrolled the eastern Mediterranean, taking Malta, Egypt, Transjordan, and Cyprus, while a friendly regime would be set up in Iraq under Rashid Ali, which would conquer Kuwait, removing the British from the Middle East. This would have massive effects on the war going forward. First off, it's possible that with such serious losses, the British would give up right here. The Suez was vital to the maintenance of the British Empire, and its capture would have serious ramifications. On top of that, the Axis now have access to the oil reserves they need to continue the war indefinitely, while the British have lost most of their oil reserves. This also put the Germans just south of the Caucasus, nearly encircling European Russia. And I can see the Germans negotiating with Iran on allowing them to cross their territory for the future invasion of the Soviet Union. This fact wouldn't be lost on the Russians, who would try and see how hostile the Germans were feeling at this point. They might even send overtures to the British, trying to give them the hope that the Russians would join their side and invade Germany, while negotiating a continued peace with the Germans behind their backs. First, I'm going to say the British wouldn't surrender, not because they're confident or determined, but because they'd be under significant international pressure not to do so. At this point, Britain was housing the Polish, Norwegian, Dutch, Belgian, and French governments in exile. FDR, who actively tried to help the British in our timeline, would desperately push Congress to allow greater material to flow to the Brits, while Russia, fearing the prospect of facing the Germans alone, would try and convince the British to keep up the fight. The Russians, meanwhile, would still get invaded in the summer of 1941. Stalin did everything he could in our timeline not to piss off the Germans, giving them all the resources detailed in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact on schedule, and refusing to hear out anyone who told him about the impending German invasion. He was just as guilty of appeasement as the West. Even if Stalin starts moving divisions to the West, it won't be at a very quick pace so as not to alert the Germans, and it won't be enough to deter Hitler. The Axis occupation of the Middle East would be left mostly to the Italians to free up German troops, while the Germans would bring in Iraqis and Iranians to assist in the crusade against Soviet Russia, perhaps offering territorial compensation to the Iranians for their assistance. Either way, the Italians still invade Greece in early 1941, but in our timeline, the Italians felt slighted by the Germans for not being invited to the surrender of France, so they didn't inform the Germans before invading Greece. This doesn't happen in this timeline. The Germans probably don't send any real divisions to help the Italians, but they could get Bulgaria to join the invasion force. The invasion of Greece failed mostly because the Italian army was led by fascist loyalists who had little experience and didn't garner much loyalty from their troops, but in this timeline, Mussolini allows competent commanders to lead his armies, so the invasion would go much smoother. Between this and Bulgarian assistance, the Greeks would be crushed in about a month, and without British support, would not hold out long in Crete. This does nothing about Yugoslavia, who would still have a popular revolt on March 27th against their pro-Axis government and go to war with the Germans before being crushed by all their neighbors. This wouldn't delay the Germans very much, but to give the forces in the Middle East enough time to resupply and recruit locals, the Germans would wait till early June to begin the invasion of the Soviet Union. 
The invasion of Russia would commence, in its early stages, much the same way as in our timeline. The differences would come first from the fact that the German officers, taking into account the vast size of Russia, would give their armies winter gear for the future. Second, while I know many people would find the forces operating in the Caucasus as decisive, I doubt they'd get that far given the logistical issues of operating out of the Middle East. I imagine they'd be able to seize Baku, but not much more. In Europe, the Germans would march forward, but instead of trying to just gobble up territory, they would focus on capturing Leningrad and Moscow. Leningrad would fall relatively easily, while half of Army Group Center would not be diverted to attack the forces in the Ukraine. In our timeline, Stalin decided to stay in Moscow to boost the morale of the public, and I doubt this decision would change, given that the Soviets are faced with catastrophe in both timelines. Given that the invasion has started a bit earlier, and they haven't waited for the Battle of Kiev before marching on Moscow, the Germans would be able to seize the Soviet capital, where Stalin would probably kill himself. But the brutality of that operation and the overextended supply lines would mean that they'd have to stop there as winter sets in. This would leave Army Group South in a tenuous situation, as they'd still be dealing with the armies in the Ukraine. However, upon hearing that Stalin was dead, I doubt the Soviet soldiers would stand and die in the Ukraine, but now would come a more problematic situation for their country. During 1941, Stalin had unquestionable control of the USSR and no designated successor. This would lead to a crisis of leadership in the Soviet Union's higher echelons, and while the nation might stay together on paper, factionalism would rise and the government would start to splinter. The Russians would be without a functioning central command as commissars and politicians would try to seize power and order would start to break down. Meanwhile, in Asia, the Japanese would be preparing to launch their invasion of the Soviet Far East. There were a number of factors that led the Japanese to attack Pearl Harbor and the South Pacific rather than the Soviet Union, the Battle of Kalkin Gol being one of them. In that battle, it became clear to the Japanese that the army didn't have the tanks to deal with the Russian heavy armor, which was true, the Japanese didn't even have heavy tanks. The other reason was that there was no incentive to. The South Pacific had only America to defend it, as all the other colonial powers were engaged in war with Germany. But the primary reason was that Germany signed their non-aggression pact with Russia and didn't let the Japanese in on their plans. If they had actually cooperated with the Japanese over this decision, then it's highly probable the Japanese, who were trying to remove Russian influence in China, would have joined the Germans. The Japanese probably would have worked with the Germans to take out the threat of communism once and for all, while the Germans would assure them that the European states under Germany's control would hand over their colonies to Japan after the the war was over. The Japanese, aware of their lack of armor, would wait until the Siberian divisions had started to move to rescue Moscow before launching their invasion. They would capture Vladivostok and other coastal areas around the Soviet Far East, as well as launch a full invasion out of Manchukuo, though it is not clear how far this invasion would actually get. The Russians, more focused on saving their European territories, would be willing to give up much of Siberia to the Japanese, putting only a token resistance up, trading space for time. The Mongolians, who were Russian puppet at this point, would be left to defend themselves and be crushed by the Japanese, who would set up a nationalist regime there. This great pincer movement would wear down the Russians, flanked on all sides and isolated from any possible allies. Finland, Germany, Romania, Iran, and Japan would work together, with help from several other nations, to finally bring down the massive Russian Empire and even this would be barely enough. Now, all the British would have is hope. They couldn't intervene in the Pacific against Japan given their sorry state in Europe and the loss of the Suez. They'd be without allies except the Russians, who would be in a state of collapse. They'd be incapable of retaliation and trying to prop up an empire that would quickly become unaffordable. The American public would be glad to see the end of the Soviet regime, while Roosevelt would be in panic mode. The implications of this war would not be lost in the American political elite, who would have to start shoring up the Western Hemisphere against any incursions by the Germans and Japanese, while offering to aid the British as best they can. The Texas military involvement in Russia would last five to eight years at least, and drag on possibly longer. But for the Japanese, their involvement in Russia wouldn't be enough. They wanted to build their Greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere, which is just a colorful way of saying they wanted to replace European control of Asia with their own. They would turn to the Pacific eventually. This drive to the South Pacific wouldn't happen until late 1943 at the earliest, once they could secure their holdings in Russia. Though it would achieve much of the same results, the primary difference would be that with much of the Japanese army occupied in in Russia, the Japanese would be warier of getting the United States involved, and would avoid invading the Philippines or attacking Pearl Harbor. This would, in effect, prevent the Americans from entering the war. They would never have the reason, or the will, 
to fight the Axis, and so the rest of the world would be left to its fate. If Roosevelt dies in 1945, as he would have no reason not to, then it's hard to believe that the British would carry on much longer than that, as Truman, without the skillful wordsmanship of Roosevelt, wouldn't have given much hope to the war-weary Brits, who would soon bow out. I think Roosevelt would be elected in 1944, given that he had already won three terms before that, and by now he would have kept America at peace. By 1944, the Japanese would seize most of the South Pacific, and Britain, its empire barely intact, with Australia, would surrender to the Japanese, leaving them as the masters of the Pacific. The British would also surrender to the Germans and Italians, allowing them to keep the territories they held and recognize German reorganization of Europe. The Russians would be left alone to splinter into different states in Central Asia, fighting without coordination against the Germans, who would slowly grind down these piecemeal armies. By 1950, the war would basically be over. Britain would be an economic dependent of the US, and they'd be forced to give up India for fear of rebel movements siding with the Japanese, while the US would have to do the same with the Philippines. The Japanese, for their part, would be so busy trying to manage their massive empire in Russia, China, and the Pacific that they'd leave India to their own devices for the most part. The fate of India is uncertain, though I would guess they'd play America and Japan against each other to try to get a better deal from both. The Philippines, meanwhile, would end up becoming a puppet of Japan. They're simply too far from the US, and they'd ultimately end up being a Japanese dependent, though the American government would do everything they could to delay this. Over time, I imagine the Americans would possibly sell Guam, seeing as it would be difficult to keep and supply that deep in Japanese territory. But places like Hawaii and Alaska would have to be shored up against possible attacks in the future. So, by 1955, the world would look like this. The Germans would be deep in Russia, with Europe very much under their thumb. Italy would be the master of the Mediterranean, and Japan would dominate the Pacific. The US props up the British Empire to prevent French and German expansion, while they secure alliances with Central and South American countries. While this isn't the total victory many envision, it still leaves the Axis with global dominance, which they'll attempt to use to menace the US, and eventually, each other. I can't tell how stable these empires would be, or if they'd outlive their founders, but they definitely change the course of the modern world and inflict unimaginable pain on the people subject to their rule. In my next video, I'll go over what challenges the Axis empires will face and the fate of those deemed unworthy of life by their new oppressors.